Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. We still have quite a few attendees joining us today. We have more than, I think, 300 folks joining us, and we're just watching them roll in for this important discussion. So thanks for bearing with us as we uh, will get started momentarily. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Amira Streeter and I am a new member of the City Club of Portland's Board of Governors and a producer of this program today. Happy fall, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon as uh, we jump into this important discussion with Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt. Before we begin today's conversation, we wanna acknowledge that the land that we are on is native land. And here in the Portland region, this land is the territory of the Multnomah, Chalamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molawa, the Wasco, Cowlitz, and many other indigenous people who have known the power and beauty of the Columbia and Willamette rivers. Together, we recognize their unbreakable connections to this land and we honor the resilience of their ancestors and hope for future generations. Thank you. It is my pleasure to help bring this event together and for all of you joining us today for this important conversation with District Attorney Mike Schmidt as he reflects on his first year in the service of Multnomah County. We'll dive into a myriad of issues ranging from racial disparities in prosecutions to the intersection of behavioral health and criminal justice systems to innovative reforms on the horizon. Now, before we begin our conversation, I'm just gonna go over a few uh, housekeeping items for today's Zoom webinar. We have received dozens of questions in advance of today's program, and we will be taking questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen. Please type your question and as we are able and as time allows, we will answer your question during the event. Please reserve the chat feature for comments or feedback as we will not uh, be reviewing the chat for questions. Participants will be muted throughout the duration of the program and will not be on screen. We will be highlighting and spotlighting our speaker, our moderator, and our ASL interpreters throughout the event. Please be patient as we navigate this virtual event and remember, you can change your view by going to the upper right corner of your screen and selecting a different view to watch the event. Please remember that this is a public space and that we are all part of a shared community. Be respectful of our speakers and other participants with your questions and comments. Now that that's out of the way, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Nikenge Harmon Johnson, President and CEO of the Urban League of Portland to moderate this discussion. Since 2015, 
Ms. Herman Johnson has led the Urban League of Portland as its chief executive officer and president. The 75 year old civil rights organization serves Oregon and Southwest Washington with direct services, research and advocacy designed to build justice in the region. Under her leadership, the Urban League of Portland has remained at the forefront of public policy on issues of equity and justice, including affordable housing, jobs and workforce, education, healthcare, and cannabis reform. Ms. Herman Johnson brings deep experience in economic policy and development, voter protection, public affairs, and advocacy. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has co-founded both the Oregon CARES Fund for Black Relief and Resilience and the Reimagine Oregon Project to Dismantle Systematic Racism. Welcome, Nikenge Harmon Johnson. Amira, thank you so much for that welcome. Uh, City Club of Portland, thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and to all the folks who've joined us, it looks like we've got more than 200 people uh, who have uh, joined us here in the virtual room. Uh, it means a lot to have you here today, so thanks. Uh, also, thanks to our guest today, DA Mike Schmidt from Multnomah County. Mike, good morning, or good afternoon. It's good to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you too, Nikenge. Uh, we're going to jump in, Mike, because as Amira mentioned, uh, City Club has received dozens of questions. I have received uh, five or six questions uh, via Twitter, and I will check back there. Um, and then um, I've got some questions of my own that I want to ask you, so uh, no, no rest for the weary. Um, as we get started, Mike, I'd like to give you a chance to, to introduce yourself a little bit um, and to really jump into why it is um, that we're here today, which is to hear about who our DA is, uh, the work that he has done uh, in his first year, and then to go a little bit further. Um, so if you would please just take a moment uh, to introduce yourself, tell us um, who you are and tell us why our DA matters. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nikenge, and, and thank you to the City Club as well for hosting uh, this great event and an important conversation about our public safety here in Multnomah County. So I am Mike Schmidt. I'm the District Attorney of Multnomah County, uh, and I have been in that role for now a little bit over a year. Uh, prior to becoming the District Attorney, uh, I started my legal career after graduating locally from Lewis and Clark. Uh, I started as a deputy district attorney in this office. Um, I started as an intern and I prosecuted cases here for approximately the next six years after that. Uh, and then I left the district attorney's office, uh, you know, essentially because I felt like maybe I wasn't having the impact that I thought that I could, uh, especially in the criminal justice reform conversation. And I worked for the legislature and then ultimately ended up being appointed to be the director of a small state agency called Oregon's Criminal Justice Commission, which is a, an agency that relies on looking at data and evidence and funding innovative practices uh, across the state of Oregon. And I did that job for also approximately six years uh, where I got to uh, you know, tour not only uh, facilities and, and meet people across the state of Oregon, but across the country and even across the world when I got to go to Norway and tour their prison system and see how they do things to get uh, really excellent results. Uh, so all of that knowledge, all of that background, uh, when I realized that the current incumbent uh, of the office was not going to run again, I decided that it was my time to raise my hand and uh, bring that that experience of data, uh, what works, uh, you know, and then the experience of talking to people from across the country into the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. Uh, and so with that background, I was elected on uh, May 19th. Uh, and little did I know I was going to get started uh, soon after that. Uh, and so I got uh, started on August 1st. And we can talk more about how that happened. But that's my background and, and kind of what I brought to the office. Uh, thanks, Mike. Will you tell us why you wanted to be a lawyer in the first place? We hear why you want to, wanted to be DA and what brought you to this role, but what made you want to become a lawyer? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, so I actually, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, uh, and neither of my family, none, neither of my parents are attorneys. Uh, I really didn't have much exposure to the law. Uh, and after graduating college, I went down and I taught high school in New Orleans. Uh, in 2003 to 2005, right before Hurricane Katrina came through and, and, and really devastated that city. 
Uh, and it was really that experience that exposed me to a lot of issues in our systems and our educational system, of course, as a teacher, uh, but also in our criminal justice system. Uh, I had students that were victims of crime. I had students that were uh, themselves accused and in one case devastatingly wrongfully accused of committing a crime at 14 years old. Uh, I saw how they were treated by the system. And, and I should say I taught in the public schools. My students were predominantly black. Of course, I was white. My experience, my upbringing, upbringing was completely the opposite. Uh, and I saw the injustice in that. I saw that the way that I grew up and the way I was treated by the criminal system was much different than what my students experienced. Uh, and so I, in 2005, right as Hurricane Katrina uh, came into the city of New Orleans, I had just moved to Portland to attend law school uh, because I thought I was going to make a difference. And at first I thought maybe environmental law, working in environmental issues would be my path. Uh, but then I got an internship in the district attorney's office and it really brought back for me full circle the experiences that I saw with my students. And I thought being an attorney and especially a prosecutor, uh, I could be in there, uh, get in the system and, and make some of the changes that I thought were really necessary. Thank you. I want, I want to have a chance to, to get to know you better and I want the audience to uh, get to know something about you, especially because we're highlighting your first year in office. Uh, so let's talk about that first year. Uh, you started a little bit earlier than you had planned uh, when your predecessor uh, resigned. Um, and it was a year uh, unlike any that we've experienced um, in, our, uh, in our community or in our country before. Uh, talk a little bit about what, your, about what your first year was like and maybe some things that you've accomplished. Yeah, thanks. It's certainly been um, a wild ride, uh, that's for sure. Uh, so just to take it back even before the first year, when I started campaigning for this position, you know, I talked about wanting to, to use data and, and change the way we do things. Little did I know that during the campaign, we'd be entering a uh, national and international global pandemic. Uh, and so that really started off uh, towards the end of the campaign. And then I won the election on May 19th. Six days later, George Floyd would be murdered at the hands of a police officer, uh, which just really, of course, as we all know, touched off uh, really a, also an international movement of uh, civil rights, of, of criminal justice uh, reform and, and hearing from folks how that system has failed, especially black and brown people. Uh, and so elected May 19, uh, within a week, uh, Portlanders are in the streets. A few days after that, our chief of police is resigning and our district attorney is announcing his resignation. Uh, and so the governor gave me a call and said, uh, would you be willing to step in earlier than you're supposed to? Because I was supposed to start January 1. So I'm not even supposed to be a year in at this point. Uh, but I got started on August 1st. Uh, and I remember it very well. Uh, I remember it vividly. We were in the old courthouse, which now we're in the new building. Uh, and I remember pacing around. Mike, the office. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I wish we were in, we were in the room together. That would be great. Um, but I want you to finish this, but I also want to know, how did you feel when you saw the police chief resign, when you saw your predecessor resign right after, you know, you had won election and these, these um, major, major events were taking place in the community? What, what was the feeling in your chest? You know, I remember people being out in the streets. I remember going out myself uh, to be a part of uh, experiencing, you know, why people were out there and hearing from them. And I saw like just a tremendous amount of pain. Uh, a lot of the issues that I had ran on, I thought were actually a lot of the issues that were brought to the forefront uh, of needing to change. Um, and so it was, in some ways, it was, of course, exciting to see some of these things happen. It was painful to see um, a lot of this voiced. And then I remember as it was running up, um, you know, people being arrested in, in, in mass uh, in waves. We had the federal government come in and, and Donald Trump uh, making Portland uh, a part of his reelection campaign and really trying to highlight that and, and escalating uh, violence in our streets with federal officers from all over the country. Um, when the governor called me, you know, obviously I was very uh, nervous, uh, a lot of uh, anxiety about what to do, but I also felt a very keen urge that 
it was my responsibility to, to get in there and to, and to start and to do the work and, and thought that I could, you know, help uh, maybe deescalate tensions and, and honor people's voices uh, that were telling us the system wasn't working. Um, and so it was a, it was a big mixed emotions. Obviously I had thought I'm going to have till January to put policies in place and people in place, and it's going to be very regimented. And, and instead I ended up, um, you know, getting drafted in early. So it, it was a, a lot of different emotions at once. So as you took on the job, go, go ahead. No. So as I took on the job, exactly. As I took on the job, uh, I remember day one, you know, and I had at that point. So to set the scene, August 1st was about 60 days into nightly protests. Uh, August 1st was also uh, right when the federal government, the federal officers who were here were withdrawing essentially uh, from our streets. I had 550 cases on my desk that we had to decide, what are we going to do with these cases? Are we going to prosecute all these people who were arrested throughout the protests? Uh, or what are we going to do with those? And, and so I remember talking to my executive team, talking to the deputies who are on the ground, and of course, my own experience being there, and then talking to community members and hearing their experience of being in the streets. And, and what I quickly saw was that a lot of people, if not the majority of people being arrested, were people who were out there to have their voice heard. They weren't there to destroy our community. They weren't there to destroy public safety. They were there to say that we, the criminal justice system, have failed them for way too long. Uh, and so what I did within 10 days of my first day in office was announce a policy that said, look, we are not going to prosecute people using the might of the criminal justice system to silence their voices saying that the criminal justice system is failing. Uh, and we drew a line and we said, if you're damaging things and you're, you're damaging property and, and destruction, you're lighting things on fire, that's where we're going to focus our resources and prosecution. Because that also uh, protects the rights of people to have their speech heard, uh, to make sure that people who are engaging in violence uh, do get prosecuted, but we're not gonna prosecute people who are out there to have their voices heard. And, and we drew that line uh, right off the bat to honor uh, those who were telling us we need to change things. Um, obviously that was a, a, a major decision uh, right, off, right out the gate for me. And it, it started into just a, a whole litany of, of other things nationally. Suddenly I'm in, in Trump's speeches and talking points on Tucker Carlson and, and, and just a bunch of things that you nobody I think is ready for uh, when they're first starting a, a local elected office. So given that backdrop, given all that you uh, faced during the very beginning of your term in office, Let's talk about, you know, uh, so there's that major decision, 550 cases that you had on your desk. Um, put that in context, first of all, how many cases would normally, you know, would, would, would the DA's office normally be uh, uh, having uh, sitting on the desk at one time? Can you tell well, us? Well, so if, uh, that was just 550 protest cases. Uh, and so, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. course, that doesn't uh, account for everything else that the DA's office would normally be prosecuting under the circumstances. So all of those cases remain. Uh, but for me, it really was, what are we going to focus our resources on? And, and one of the things I ran on was public safety, things that actually impact keeping our community safe and using our limited resources to prosecute people who are in the streets telling us we're not doing a good job holding a sign is not a good use. Those people are not going to go on to rob banks or do other negative things in our community. So focus on the people who are doing uh, the harm and the damage is, is where we drew the line. So it was a, a workload that doesn't typically exist for this office. It was unprecedented. So there's really not an analog to say, normally we would have 100 protest cases, but we had 550. Normally we wouldn't have hardly any of these types of cases. It was very specific. Uh, so it was a whole new line of, of work and resource that, that we have had to put into uh, and, and just focusing on the people who, who were doing damage has been a major line. And we've prosecuted over 200 of those cases or initiated prosecutions. So Mike, let's talk about your priorities and how you, how you reach them. Um, you've got limited resources that you've mentioned uh, and the goal for you uh, and for your office is to create, is to foster public safety. We can talk more about what that means and 
as we as we go along. But how do you set your priorities, and who are you talking to uh, in around the community to help you? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, in in running, I wanted to prioritize what what I'm characterizing as public safety. But a lot of the public safety I get was from talking to community members. I remember talking to to one individual, and he during the campaign said to me, he said. And, and I have kids. He said, hey, uh, you take your kids to the park? And I said, yeah, I love taking the kids to the park. And he said, wow, you feel safe taking your kids to the park? And I said, yeah, absolutely I do. And he's a black man with black children. And he said, that's public safety. When I feel like you, when I take my kids to the park, that is public safety. And, and that's really stayed with me that my experience of public safety was not his experience of public safety. Uh, so one of the very first things I did was put together a, a transition team. Um, and unfortunately, I got transitioned sooner than I anticipated. But I reached out immediately to people from all over our community uh, who represent various constituencies and, and work on issues. Uh, and, you know, they were actually instrumental in helping me on how I was gonna approach uh, the protest uh, situation. And, and I got their advice on how to approach those things. Uh, since then, I've continued meeting with community groups uh, from all over. Uh, you know, so uh, just this week, I met with the Albina Ministerial Alliance. I appreciate their sage advice always. Uh, I have talked to um, you know different uh, community groups in terms of uh, neighborhood associations. I've gone out and spoken to some of them especially those that were engaged in doing outreach to their houseless neighbors. I got to actually uh, be on the streets and, and see that interaction. Uh, so, you know, obviously I talk to my executive team uh, on a daily basis in terms of the office. And I'm proud to say uh, now uh, Multnomah County has the most diverse executive team in its history in the, in the district attorney's office uh, after some promotions and some hiring of some folks. Uh, so I take it. What does that mean, Mike? Uh, well, when you say so, it has the most, most diverse executive team, what, what's that look like? Yeah, what's that look like? Well, uh, I promoted uh, Senior Deputy District Attorney Glenn Banfield, who's been a prosecutor in this office for over 20 years, deep roots. And I like to joke with Glenn uh, that he was on to criminal justice reform before it was cool. Uh, but Glenn is a Black attorney in this office. He's been working on these issues. And, and truly, he's seen uh, these inequities and, and disparities in our system for a long time. And he and I have had those conversations. Uh, I promoted Jamila Williams, who's longtime uh, person working in our uh, HR department and promoted her to run the operations side. Jamila also has deep roots in this community. Uh, her mother has been very active in this community, so we're extremely excited to have her. Uh, so there's just two positions. We've made some other hirings. Uh, I hired recently uh, Senior Deputy District Attorney Ernie Warren, a career defense attorney, ran for judge in this community, founded the first Black-owned uh, law firm in the state of Oregon. So really trying to get diverse experience to help guide me and my decision making and, and how these policies impact people uh, in, in communities across uh, Multnomah County. Okay, let's talk a bit about uh, public safety. I appreciate the example that you gave uh, from a member of the community who talked to you about, you know, taking your children to the park versus him taking his children to the park. Um, that, that theme is something I'd like to jump into a little bit more. Um, you've been hearing a lot. We, if anyone, if you're paying attention, we've all been hearing a lot about um, what Portland being unsafe, whether it's in the national news or even some local headlines. Um, I think uh, there are um, uh, various uh, constituencies who've reached out to you directly to say, you know, you're not doing this, but you're not doing that. Uh, there are folks um, in other parts of town who are saying the same thing. Here's what you need to do better, and here's uh, what's not going well. Um, what strikes me is when people talk about Portland being unsafe. Uh, Multnomah County is, you know, it's never been so unsafe. What I think about when I hear that is unsafe for whom and how. I remember very clearly, and I think I've told this story in the City Club uh, uh, venue before, um, you know, being a kid and not being, um, not feeling safe to walk across Pioneer Square downtown because the skinheads uh, and the neo-Nazis were all in court <laughs> in Pioneer Square. It's smack dab in the middle of our city. Um, and so as a kid, I'd have to take the long way around when I was downtown and having to keep our eyes open um, because it wasn't safe. Um, certain parts of town, I would do volunteer work and my mother would say, I don't know if I want you to go to this one because it's in the wrong part of town. Um, and we know that there are white supremacists there who, who, who could be dangerous to, you know, to my child, my mom would say. 
um, as a woman. There are times when, you know, I certainly don't uh, walk around uh, downtown at night. Um, I like to run at night and it's not something that I get to do very often because what safety is for me is different than it might be for you if you wanted to take that same uh, run. Um, so when we talk about unsafe now versus, you know, how things were before, it's interesting to me because who gets to decide what public safety is? Who gets to feel safe and who doesn't? And I'm noticing so many voices now talk about how they feel unsafe. Um, when I know for a long time, folks like me have said, well, we feel unsafe. And suddenly there's this major outcry and we've got, you know, what might even be considered an emergency um, because the right people feel unsafe. Talk to me a little bit about that as you're the DA and you're hearing from all these different folks um, about what they want, what they insist upon. Um, what, how are you able to sort out what public safety means uh, and how you further decide what you're going to prioritize going into your second year? Yeah, well, you're exactly right. Um, I've heard from people all across the community. Uh, you know, there were people who were uh, saying how, you know, when people were marching in the streets uh, for criminal justice reform, uh, that they felt unsafe or windows smashing. Uh, and I've heard from people who are experiencing gun violence disproportionately. Uh, our Black community, uh, when you look at who's been uh, shot and victims of gun violence, hugely disproportionate. Um, I've talked to people uh, living who are houseless. Uh, that is an extremely vulnerable community. Uh, we see per the number of people who are living on the streets, the rate of their victimization is, is tremendous. Um, so you're exactly right. Safety means things uh, to different people. Uh, for me, uh, with the limited resources we have, um, I've prioritized violent crime. I think that that is um, the most pressing issue. And, and what has been over the last, the entirety of my, my term so far uh, has been gun violence, has been a, a pressing need. And, so I've put my resources into my units that, that specialize in, in gun violence. Uh, but I think when I hear from people in the community, a lot of other things go into, into safety. Obviously there's economics of safety, food security, all these other things that the district attorney doesn't have uh, really a role in. Uh, but I've been very vocal in advocating uh, for investments and in services into community-based organizations because the same communities that we're seeing the violence in, the gun violence, are the same communities that we've seen divestment in for decades. Uh, and you can just put the maps right on top of each other and it's almost a perfect overlay. So, you know, I've tried to, you know, even though prosecution is not the answer for some safety, uh, I've tried to voice that we need to be funding some of those services if we're ever going to get upstream of things uh, like gun violence. Uh, but for me and my limited resources, really, I'm focusing on, you know, person crimes where people are hurt and injured. Uh, we do prosecute all crimes across the board, but I've put most of my resources uh, into that uh, bucket. So as we talk about what public safety looks like, let's talk about the folks who are traditionally responsible for creating it. And I know there are ASL folks. Okay, I want to make sure we don't lose them. Um, we often think about the police. Uh, those are, that's sort of the face of public safety in, uh, in the community for some of us, for many of us, it's, it's not true. Um, but you mentioned earlier, uh, George Floyd um, and his murder at the hands of, my words, at the hands of Officer Derek Chauvin. Um, the, the officer was prosecuted and there are other prosecutions that are coming um, in Minnesota. Um, during all of this, um, being far away in Oregon and, and all of us watching what was happening in Minnesota, the feeling that I had was, was a, one of crossing my fingers, was hoping, was hoping that the officers who murdered George Floyd would be prosecuted, was hoping that there would be some accountability. And very often, um, I'm afraid to hope uh, when prosecutors, I mean, when police are involved in uh, wrongfully taking life or causing grievous injury, because again and again, um, because of immunity, they aren't held accountable again and again, because prosecutors don't have the will um, to prosecute police officers, the ones who are bad actors aren't held accountable. So we're stuck, we're stuck in this system. At least that's the way it feels. So let's talk more about that. Uh, the Portland Police Bureau is one that has a, uh, a checkered past and present. 
Um, we know that if there's a consent uh, agreement um, with a or settlement rather uh, with um, with federal DOJ about the Portland Police Department and its use of force um, against uh, Portlanders, and it's been in place for years. Uh, we know that there's a lot of push and pull with community members and community advisory groups and uh, elected officials about what the Portland Police should be doing differently in service of the, of the community. But I think nearly everyone agrees right now, it's not working. Um, the additional layer that many of us have just discovered is that the DA is also involved, right? You're now more popular than, you, than you, the, your office would have been, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and, that's, and that's a good thing. People should know um, how your office works. But talk about how, whether, frankly, you believe in transparency and accountability um, for uh, the police officers in your jurisdiction and what you're doing to make it happen. Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and I think, you know, this is an issue that, that during the campaign we saw, it, it cuts across political ideology. People believe that if you break the law, you should be held accountable and it doesn't matter your politics. Uh, and so this has been an important thing for me and, and knowing some of the history of uh, prosecutions or, or lack thereof of police officers and how the grand jury process plays into these things and how, you know, the prosecutor has a lot of power uh, to make decisions and uh, to present cases to the grand jury. It was important for me to uh, set right out of the gate, you know, some, some changes to the way that things were done. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, most proud of uh, changing is that to date, when we have a case that involves uh, an officer in, in a shooting where somebody dies, loses their life, uh, we are taking uh, and asking for an outside review uh, with us of that case. And so, for example, uh, the very first case I had like this, uh, I actually went out and, and hired a defense attorney to be a, a special prosecutor. Uh, and, and this was Sam Kaufman. He has a, 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 perf, you know, a great history in this community of being a defense attorney. Uh, very well respected, well regarded. And I asked him to come in and, and it wasn't, and I said, you know, Sam, I want you to look at this case. Defense attorneys, in some ways, are ideally situated to help us in this situation because they themselves have been uh, cross-examining police officers their entire careers. So who better to bring in and help us look at a case and make sure that we're asking all the hard questions. We're not glossing over anything, that we're not letting you know, our relationship or bias creep in to the way that we handle these cases and present them to the grand jury. Uh, since then, we've had several other cases and I've asked and reached out and had uh, assistance from the Oregon Department of Justice. Uh, and again, the Department of Justice uh, does not have that day-to-day -day working relationship with the local police that we do. Uh, on a Monday or Tuesday, uh, Portland police officers are our witnesses. And so to then on Wednesday say, now you're our defendant, you know, it's just human nature that you, that, you know, maybe uh, even with the best intentions, uh, some uh, bias can creep into decision-making or how hard you're willing to question somebody or because it can be uncomfortable. So I've made sure in every one of those cases, uh, even without the resources budgeted, that I've either brought in external help with Sam Kaufman or with the Department of Justice when the Attorney General has been willing to do that. That's a major change. Uh, that's never happened before, uh, bringing in a defense attorney to be a special prosecutor in one of those cases, uh, to my knowledge, in, this, in Oregon's history. Uh, so that's, a, that's one big step to assure the community that you know, the fix isn't in. This isn't just that, hey, we're friends and so we're gonna work together on this, but we're bringing outside eyes to look at these cases alongside us. Uh, and then- Okay, you know, I hear that, but you know I'm gonna, I mean, you, you can probably guess what I'm gonna ask you is, then given all the use of the force that we, we saw uh, on TV um, last year during protests and elsewhere, given um, all of the, uh, the shootings um, of Portlanders, um, both houseless and housed, and um, that we've seen uh, recently, why aren't there more prosecutions of police officers? Why aren't more cops uh, being held to account for some of the violence we've seen them perpetuate in the community? It's a question I've gotten a lot on Twitter. Uh, it's a question that people are talking about uh, pretty frequently in the rooms that I'm in. Um, and now I got a chance to, to ask you. Yeah, well, so I think, you know, there are multiple layers to that question. One is the law. 
uh, we have the criminal law that we have. Uh, officers are by law entitled to use force when infectuating arrests or in their defense or in defense of others. Uh, so there are laws that we have to apply to every criminal case. Uh, and so our job is to make sure that we're looking at the facts and applying it to the law in a non-biased way. But the laws are still what the laws are and officers have a right to use force uh, in those situations. So our criminal analysis is very narrow. It really is, do they not have a legal justification for the force that they use? Because they're entitled to use force. And that's our narrow question that we have to overcome. That's one layer is the law. The second layer locally that I think is a challenge uh, that ought to be addressed is who does the investigations? Uh, who investigates uh, the police officers uh, when they're engaged in conduct uh, that might be criminal? And the answer for Portland police is Portland police. Uh, and that's not to say that they would be against changing that. I've had conversations uh, with Portland police officers, with the chief, and they have said to me, like, look, we would love to have somebody else do these investigations because we understand for the public perception, there's a conflict of interest there. Uh, but we ought to make that happen. There ought to be independent in investigations of the Portland police when it is potential that they are uh, you know, involved in something that's criminal by their use of force. Uh, and then so what does that look like? Well, in, in other places, um, you know, around our state, it's typically a different and outside law enforcement agency would do the investigation. Uh, so a neighboring agency from a neighboring jurisdiction, that's how most of Oregon does it. Uh, in my colleague in San Francisco, uh, Chase Boudin, who uh, he and I have spoken at length about this, he actually has in his agency prosecutors and detectives and investigators whose entire job is just to handle cases involving the police. So he has that independence in the prosecutor's office, uh, and they are completely walled off from the day-to-day -day operations of the district attorney's office that works with the police on a, on a daily basis. So that's a different model. Uh, you know, I think nationally, there's a conversation and a, and a debate going on about attorneys general. Uh, and we brought up the Derek Chauvin case, and I think most people would recognize that in that situation, it wasn't the local prosecutor who charged and successfully prosecuted Derek Chauvin, it was the Attorney General Keith Ellison. Uh, so I think there are different models uh, to do investigations, but I think it is important that prosecution and investigations should be handled uh, by somebody who does not have that day-to-day -day working relationship with the police because it, it both it doesn't look good to the, to the community and you, know, you, can, you can miss things or, or let that kind of bias creep in. I appreciate that. Um, I am going to take some questions uh, from my Twitter feed. Uh, I know that City Club um, folks who are watching live here have also dropped, dropped questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to uh, go to some of those now. Um, first, I've got a question from Sarah, and she wants me to ask you, how do you plan to stay the course on the progressive agenda on which you were originally elected, despite intense counter pressure? It seems like there's a, black, a backlash from uh, protests in support of uh, the movement for Black Lives. Um, what are you going to do to stand up to some of the naysayers, naysayers and some of the more uh, conservative folks um, who just want their city to go back to normal? Those of us who are cranky, uh, unhappy, and feel unsafe should shut up about it to let business uh, get back to being business. Um, who does your reform coalition currently include? Yeah. Big uh, question. Yeah, a lot of questions there, but great questions. Um, you know, first of all, uh, Going back to, to normal, uh, normal for who, and, and to your question, the Kenge, public safety for who, like that's not the goal to get back to normal. We need to recognize that we just went through last summer and it continues now, especially in the policy realm, uh, an intense debate over the way normal was not working and was failing the community. So my goal is not to get us back to normal. Uh, my goal is to work on the things that, that I said I would, and we're making good progress. Um, we're laying the foundation already for a restorative justice program, uh, and we're working with a, a group uh, for, that's providing us technical assistance called Impact Justice. They've helped other prosecutors around the country in, in incorporate restorative practices uh, into their prosecution models. 
And for me, you know, that's going to look like getting people out of prosecution if we can and, and avoid the system altogether. Or when we can't, when there still needs to be a system response, still incorporating restorative practices because we know it serves victims better. They have higher uh, rates of, of feeling like they were actually had their harm addressed and lower crime after uh, somebody goes through that type of a process. So we're laying the foundation, the state, uh, you know, set aside $4 million for local communities to uh, write grants for restorative justice programs. I know Multnomah County will be a part of that because I'm in those conversations. Um, one of the things I ran on was uh, Measure 11 reform and uh, changing the way our laws right now have essentially shifted the power away from judges to make sentencing decisions and put it in the hands of prosecutors. I testified on that in, uh, down in Salem uh, repeatedly on that issue, uh, but locally that doesn't mean just because the law didn't change that we're not still working on that. Locally we're working with the Department of Community Justice and the courts and the defense bar to set up a diversion court called STEP and we know that that will be up and running here in the next couple months where we're gonna be looking at people who are charged with measure 11 crimes. And instead of uh, in implementing that mandatory prison sentence, trying to put them in a problem solving court, uh, working collaboratively uh, with uh, a treatment professionals and Department of Community Justice. So that's another uh, you know, innovation that we're working on. Just uh, transparency, uh, data transparency. Uh, if people go to our website, which is mcda.us. We have two dashboards up right now, one on how we handle protest cases. Repeat, repeat your website, please, Mike. Slow, slow yeah. down and say it again. Thank you, uh, www.mcda.us. Uh, and we have two dashboards, data dashboards up there right now, uh, one on gun violence, one on the protest cases. And so people can see for themselves, you don't have to believe the hype or the headlines, you can actually go and see what we're doing in terms of prosecutions in those areas. And it's, uh, we're working with Florida International University and Portland State University. Uh, and we'll be rolling out dozens of more dashboards here in the coming months uh, with the, what we're calling the PPI initiative, which is a prosecutor index uh, initiative. So people will actually get to see what it is our office is doing uh, because it's not just counting convictions. Uh, we're actually trying to get a much deeper look into who is going through our system, both victims and defendants, what are the outcomes? So transparency, I think is a huge uh, key to building public trust. Uh, so, you know, I'm staying the course, I've got lots of things uh, going on and uh, I'd be remiss not to, uh, you know, uh, state about our justice integrity unit. Uh, we just started, it's the uh, only one in the state of Oregon where we have two attorneys who are completely dedicated not only to making sure uh, that we're doing things the right way in terms of our cases, but looking back. You know, most of these reforms that I'm talking about are looking forward. In the future, we're gonna change this or we're gonna do this different in the future. The Justice Integrity Unit is the one place where we're saying, we've made mistakes in the past. We've caused harm in the past. We need to own up to that and look at that. And so that unit, is not only going to be working with partners in our community like Lewis and Clark and, and, their, and Elisa Kaplan, who heads up their uh, law uh, commission that works on these issues, but also the Innocence Project and OJRC, other stakeholders to help us to identify if there are any uh, wrongful convictions. We need to uh, fix that immediately. But also looking at the way we've sentenced people in the past. You know, just even if we were right on what the outcome was in terms of somebody being found guilty or not, we know that the sentencing has been disparate and has uh, been punitive and especially, uh, and we've changed these practices, but how we've sentenced youth and juveniles in the past to adult measure 11 sentences. Now with, the, with this unit and the passage of Senate Bill 819, for the first time ever, prosecutors have a power to look backwards and in the interest of justice, motion for the court to re-sentence somebody. So the reforms are both looking prospectively, of course, but we're also doing the hard work of looking in the mirror and looking back. So Mike, you know, trust is a theme of a lot of the questions that I'm seeing. Uh, you know, I voted for you, let's see. 
I voted for you, uh, I do it again, um, but I'm seeing a lack of confidence uh, of my friends and neighbors. Uh, they're saying that, uh, you know, maybe they'll call the police, but the police, uh, you know, aren't uh, solving crimes and they're not arresting people. And if they do manage to solve someone or to, 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 to solve a case um, and, uh, and to charge someone that your office isn't prosecuting them. Um, I believe in what you're doing, but I don't trust that it's going to really make our community a different place. Um, when there are other questions about trust here, folks saying, uh, we talked about sort of police and um, uh, violence against members of the community. Folks are saying, you know, we're seeing, uh, we've seen so many instances of police doing things that we feel are, are, are blatantly dangerous and, um, and inappropriate, and we're not seeing uh, the prosecutions of police or the accountability taking place. Um, other folks are saying, I'm a business owner and I'm seeing um, uh, lots of uh, houseless people uh, sleeping um, in front of my business, but not just sleeping in front of my business, causing disruptions. And police will come and they will arrest them. And then those folks are back on the street the next day. Um, your office isn't doing enough to help keep my business safe. Um, how can I trust that that's going to change? A lot of trust in these questions. Um, what's it going to take for you to win over uh, some of the people who voted for you the first time, but also some of the other folks who really just want their DA um, to help make their community a better, more just, safer place. Yeah, well, I think you're exactly right. Trust is is the theme. Um, you know, we've talked on uh, some of the issues that I think build trust, being transparent with our data, putting it up there, uh, you know, holding people accountable when they break the law. You know, I want to be clear. Um, the district attorney's office, we prosecute cases that are investigated uh, and that come to us. So if anybody is hearing that, um, you know, this case, uh, the DA won't prosecute it or something like that, that's not accurate. Like we are prosecuting these cases, but also let's talk about what the effectiveness is of some prosecutions. And I hear from business owners on a, on a regular basis as well. Uh, and they talk about, you know, people who are living on the streets and disruptive to business. Sometimes we have to use the right tools for the right challenge. Uh, and, you know, the fact that somebody is arrested in that situation and put in a jail cell, that's in a very expensive housing option. That's over 300 and some dollars a night to put somebody into housing. There are much better tools for dealing with that issue than the criminal justice system. And so I'm trying to focus our resources on the areas where we're going to be effective and we're actually going to increase public safety. Prosecuting somebody for sleeping on the street and for being houseless, the answer isn't a jail cell. The answer is a house. Uh, they need wraparound services. They need housing. What we have to offer them is not a solution. In fact, it frequently makes people worse off because they're separated from their belongings and they get released in the middle of the night with no place to go, and they're even worse off than they were a day ago. So the criminal, the criminal justice system is not the place to solve houselessness. We have to focus on crime. That's, that's our role. But I hear people. I mean, it makes people feel less safe. So we need, and I was proud to be joined this past, uh, this week, or last week, rather, at a press conference by the health department, by the sheriff, by community groups like POIC and Joe McFerrin because there is not a silver bullet uh, for uh, some of the issues that are facing our community right now. We play a role, but you know, looking at what's effective, I think is actually key. And we've seen, again, data and research. I always go back to the science, what works? Uh, and we've seen the research that says out of Baltimore and Boston, prosecuting people who are houseless, low level crimes like that, actually only ensures that they're going to be more likely to stay in the criminal justice system and it does not overall improve public safety so we need to use the right tools for the right job and that's what i'm doing in this office is applying that data the science to how do we increase public safety and recognizing that this system can do harm that can actually be counterproductive to public safety like when people go to prison and are released without a plan or without resources and end up back on our streets. That's a terrible recipe for public safety. We need to recognize that. So it's both prioritizing where we can actually have an impact in changing people's behavior, sometimes connecting them to resources. Uh, and you know, sometimes it's more severe than that, but making sure that we're using the right tool for the right job, I think is key to public safety. Will you talk more about that, Mike? What's the intersection uh, of behavioral health 
and your office? Where do the two match up to better serve people, um, whether they're houseless or not, um, who could use some additional support and not just punishment? Yeah, this is an area that that we need to develop, uh, and and we do uh, as you know this office we we're involved in specialty courts. We have a, a DUI court, we have a property crimes court, we have a mental health court. So those are the areas where we interact with some of these other systems. But we need to get broader than that, than just these problem solving courts, uh, because we know that sometimes deflection from the system is actually a more effective answer. But those are the services right now that are not in our community. I mean, I think if you talk to a police officer on the street, they would tell you that all too often they're confronted with a situation where their options are take someone to jail or don't arrest them and don't you know, try to just talk them down from whatever is happening. We need something in between. People need help. They need services. And it doesn't need to be police who are connecting them to services. We need more connections. Why I support uh, the Portland Street Response program, which is, uh, you know, an outreach program that can actually, it's a non-law enforcement intervention that connects people to resources. We need interventions like that because there are gaps. Using the criminal system to always be the referrer to treatment and to ration out mental health care is not a good model. Uh, so we need more things in our community to be, to give uh, those of us who are in the criminal justice system more options, more tools to get people hooked up to treatment. Sometimes it does mean prosecution. And when it does mean prosecution, we're going to look at what is the outcome that is most likely to ensure this person not coming back into our system. And frequently that's going to be uh, connecting them to services, connecting them to resources, getting at the addiction, getting at the mental health. But we need more. We need more of those services. We need more options uh, to deflect people out of the system and get to them to things that are going to work better. Mike, you were only one of only three DAs in Oregon uh, to support Measure 110. And uh, so this is, uh, for folks listening, Measure 110, um, the measure that uh, Oregon voters uh, decided to decriminalize uh, drug possession and drug use. Um, will you talk to us about why you supported 110? And I'm asking you this question now in connection with behavioral health, quite frankly. And um, we know that uh, Oregonians, um, we have very high uh, level rates of addiction and very low access to treatment uh, for those who want it. And often, um, my husband uh, is, a, is a defense attorney and a civil rights lawyer, but he spends a lot of time in court defending people. And he says the most often, sort of, the, the most frequent connection he sees um, is alcohol and drug use at the time that folks were, um, were arrested or accused of doing what they did. Um, and many of his clients uh, have persistent challenges that they're not able to overcome or they're not able to access treatment. Um, I imagine that as DA, you see a lot of folks coming through the revolving door as well um, because they're living lives that are plagued by drug and alcohol addiction in an unmanaged way. You supported Measure 110, and some folks say that's going to increase, increase drug, and, or, uh, drug use. Other folks say it's going to actually decriminalize drug use and allow folks who want to have um, a, a road out, who want to seek uh, support, they're going to be able to, to find it. I'd just like to sort of uh, hear from you. How do you sort that out? How do you um, come to, how do you come to the decision to support Measure 110? And how do you think it's going to go? Yeah, uh, great question. So three DAs, you're right, three DAs supported this. But I would uh, note that somewhere around 16 or 18 counties, if you just did the majority vote in each county, supported the passage of Measure 110. I think it passed with 60%. So I think people get this issue that the criminal justice system, that criminalizing addiction is a failed model. Uh, and it's failed in a, in a bunch of different ways. When I was the director of the Criminal Justice Commission, I actually did a deep dive on the way that we criminalized addiction in the state of Oregon. And, and so what, what really convinced me to support 110 was, again, looking at the data. And what we saw was after decades of, of data from uh, SAMHSA, which is the National Health organization that tracks data around addiction, uh, they said that uh, people who, who report using drugs uh, across race and ethnicity are, are pretty consistent. Uh, you know, about one to three percent of every race and ethnicity is using different types of, of drugs. So who is using drugs is consistent in our community. Then you look at who's being arrested and prosecuting for using drugs and it's wildly disparate. 
So already that's an unjust system. The crime is being committed consistently across races and ethnicities in our community, but who is getting the criminal intervention if this is supposed to be uh, the model for delivering treatment to people is very specifically disparate, especially to black people, native people uh, are some of the highest disparities, at least here in the state of Oregon. Uh, and so for me right away, I was like, if I'm, uh, you know, talking about criminal justice, that's unjust, you know, people being prosecuted disparately, even though the crime is being committed. So that's one, that's one of the major reasons that I supported 110, uh, because I think that, that that's a failed model. I've also gotten to, like I said, go around the world and see that there are different ways to do this. I, I've been to Norway. I went up to Canada, to Vancouver. There are different ways to get people treatment that is not through criminal prosecution. And I would just ask, you know, people uh, listening to this at, at home, just ask yourself who here knows somebody that's used drugs. Maybe you yourself have used illegal drugs, your neighbors. I think all of us could probably raise our hands. How many of them needed criminal prosecution? You know, so making drug use the crime uh, is really not, it, it's not a good approach. It drives shame, it drives stigma, it drives this behavior underground. You don't wanna tell your friends and family, you don't wanna tell your doctors, it drives it all underground. We need to be open about it. It's really when people are committing crimes that are fueled by drug use that it's an issue. But many people use drugs and it's never turned into a criminal issue. So why is that the crime? So yes, as the district attorney, I see people committing crimes that are fueled by their addiction all the time. And so when they do that, we intervene on the crime. If that's stealing a car or right now, unfortunately, catalytic converter theft is extremely high in our community. Those are things that we see that are frequently driven by somebody's addiction. Great. Once we're prosecuting that person, let's get at that addiction. Let's get the treatment in there but just criminalizing the usage of these substances was disparately impacting people. And there are many people that have been able, as I think everyone can attest to, use drugs safely, I mean, and not criminally, not go on to a life of crime. So let's use a health intervention for those folks. And then if you're committing crimes, then let's actually get at the root cause of why you're committing those crimes and get people hooked up to treatment. Uh, but just the criminal prosecution of crimes uh, or of drug use and, and not even to mention the, the racial history of, of why a lot of drug laws even exist uh, in the first place. Uh, there's just so many reasons to, to decriminalize uh, that. Mike, we're uh, at the end of our time. I wanna give you a chance to sort of give us, give us a closing, closing thought. And I'd like you to focus on uh, not just the end of year one, but what would you like to see? What would you like to be telling us at the end of year four? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the conversation and the questions. You know, people ask me this all the time. Uh, you know, are, are you still happy you have the job? Is there hope? Is, is you know, are we gonna come back? And, and I absolutely emphatically, like, I see the path forward. I see that this is a, a change. This is a time of change and there's always a lot of challenges then, but I see a very hopeful future where we are using science to drive our decisions. We're being transparent about what we're actually creating when we say we're creating public safety. We're involving more voices at the table from different perspectives than we've ever done before. I see this as a very hopeful time. We've got challenges, no doubt. Everyone across the country is facing uh, challenges and our gun violence is certainly a major challenge. But I see the path right now. We're not just doing the reactionary politics of the 90s where we're saying, hey, it's time to you know, lock people up, throw away the key. People across the community are being thoughtful in saying, no, we need to invest in community-based organizations. We need to invest in health and we need to invest in, in the law enforcement areas where we want law enforcement to uh, be intervening. And so this is different. We're in a different place than we've been, and I do see the path forward. I think things are going to be getting better here uh, locally in Multnomah County in the city of Portland. I can already see signs of that. And I think that what we're doing is we're building a more sustainable future where 10 years from now, we won't look back and say, boy, we made a lot of mistakes back then that hollowed out communities and, and targeted uh, certain communities more than others. 
we're being very uh, much more thoughtful about the interventions. And when I talk to people on the streets, you know, it's easy to get wrapped up in the comment section or Twitter or things like that. When I talk to people on the streets, I think that they, they care about these issues and they're more knowledgeable about them than maybe ever before. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful in our community. And I, that's what I want to leave with people. I think we're going in the right direction. Thank you. At the end of four years, I'm excited to come back and talk more about it. We won't wait that long, Mike. Uh, D.A. Schmidt, thank you so much. Uh, City Club, thank you. Ms. Amir Sweeter, thank you for having me today. I appreciate you. And thanks to you, uh, Nakenge. That's all the time we have for today's program. Thank you very much, uh, District Attorney Schmidt, for your time today and for addressing these important issues. Nakenge for moderating. Um, it was a great conversation. And I'd like to spend a, a, send a special thank you to my fellow producers, Bobby Reagan, Iris Marie Chavez, and Rebecca Tweed, and to Sarah and CM for providing ASL interpretation for our audience. We know that there were many questions that we weren't able to get to today, but please know that we have your questions recorded and we'll share them with our speakers after the event so they can reach out to you. And if you wanna learn more about City Club and consider uh, becoming a City Club member, please visit us at uh, www.pdxcityclub.org. And if you'd like to learn more about the Urban League of Portland and get more involved, please visit ulpdx.org. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this critical conversation. I know I learned a lot, and we hope we see you at our next event. Have a great afternoon.